We'll lead with this story, which is breaking, uh, developing as we as we speak this morning. The sacrifice of two police officers killed in a brutal ambush in Queensland is being honoured this morning. Landmarks lighting up in blue to remember their service. Constable Rachel McCrow and Constable Matthew Arnold were murdered, along with an innocent neighbour. This morning, attention is turning to the three killers and the conspiracy theories, theories which fueled this attack. Well, a former principal, a much-loved principal in North Queensland, well, he is now a cold-blooded killer. His brother, Gareth, a wild conspiracy theorist. That's actually his home where all of this took place. He was sharing some wild theories online. One of them was that Port Arthur, the massacre there, was an inside job. Now, his partner, Stacey, lived with him. She believed, too, that they were being followed by planes and drones. All three, we know how that ended, shot dead by police after that wild standoff. There is one thing the police need to try and figure out across these coming weeks, Tracy, an answer to a very simple question. What was the motive behind this horror? The offenders? Missing man Nathaniel Train, his brother Gareth Train, who owned the property, and Gareth's wife Stacey. Their motive is unclear, but Gareth was reportedly deeply involved with an online conspiracy community posting about his mistrust of police and alternative theories about the Port Arthur massacre. Their sacrifice. They paid the ultimate sacrifice because of the acts of some very evil, disturbed people. Ian, there are reports that the offenders were wound up in conspiracy theories. What more do you know about that? Welcome to Truth Core. Well, the war for your mind is well and truly underway in Australia. The nation was just subjected to another horrific tragedy, tragedy the other day with six people killed in Queensland on a rural property, two of which were police, uh... Three people who were supposedly the shooters were killed by police. And one was a innocent bystander. But before the bodies are even ready to be seen off in funeral homes and churches, we have seen the government and the media and the authorities come out against a sizable population of the Australian community blaming people who they deem to be thought criminals for this atrocity. Now, after the last few years and everything that we've been through, everything that we've been through in this country, we remember what we went through in 2021. All this, this has to do with all of that. We know what we went through. We know what they put us through. We know what they did. Remember at the time that anybody who didn't go along with what they wanted you to do was a criminal, basically. You were not allowed into stores. You were not allowed to go to work. You were not allowed to do anything. And they wanted you to believe that that was going to be forever but it wasn't forever, and you won that battle if you stayed firm in your convictions, whatever they were, that they were forcing, trying to force you to think, do, and act a certain way in public and in private. They wanted full control over you, and they got it in many, many situations and circumstances so it's not too hard to believe and it's actually kind of predictable that only a year down the track less actually since things have only really just started wrapping up they've just started putting the uh tying up the little bow on that package recently and they've done it gradually but it, it really isn't hard to believe or predict that they would now come for you for you as a thought criminal. That that people who do not believe what they want them to believe, say the things they want them to say, act the way they want them to act, and be the way they want them to be, will be demonized and oppressed. You're going to need to be strong in this coming battle. 
against the oppressive police state. Australia is slipping into totalitarianism with every single psyop that they pull. That they all serve an agenda. We are heading towards a social credit system in this country after the implication of digital identity where they will police your thoughts through the internet and through members of the public that will turn on you and rat you in to the authorities. They will be rewarded for doing this. This is the society they are setting up, an informant society, one like Nazi Germany or communist Russia, or even more so, the model they're really going for, like communist China with a social credit system. So those people who stood firm in the period of 2021 stood firm to their convictions, whatever they were. People who believe in freedom in this nation. People who might believe in a religion. Something higher than the government. Well, they have to be demonized, don't they? They have to be oppressed. And it's all their fault when somebody or something goes down. Because they have control of the media. And they're running an agenda to take control of the people. They want to control, they want to come down on all dissent. They're not going to let go of the control they had during that period of time. And we can see that with the way the media is behaving by immediately. So this guy and his brother and his brother's wife on this property reportedly started shooting at police when they turned up for a routine missing person call out. Now, what does that have to do with the views of your uncle, your brother, your your friend, who, who may not agree with you? Or what does it have to do with your views? What does it have to do with the views of anybody that somebody said a few things on social media, if that's what they really said and believed? Because it's one of those stories where they say, oh, this guy was a school principal, much loved. How did he turn into a cold-hearted killer within one year? Well, they say he had a heart attack, left his job, ended up dropping out of society, hanging out on his brother's property, apparently, who's a conspiracy theorist, and within that short period of time became a cop killer. It doesn't make any sense. Once again, it never makes any sense because they want you to believe something that doesn't make sense because then they know they control your mind. That is how they do the mind control. That is one of the ways. They also do it on a mass scale by demonizing those who disagree with the government, who don't trust the media. The police lost a lot of trust over that period of time. Remember all the protests in Melbourne. Remember the big group of protesters that ran through the police on in on Bridge Road, Richmond. Remember the CFMEU protests. Remember the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne where they shot rubber bullets at people. Remember the chokehold on the ground where they threw that kid and smashed his face into the ground. They came up from behind. Remember the footage of the girl who got choked by police. Remember the mothers who were arrested for posting things on Facebook. Remember the people even in the Islamic community in in Western Sydney who felt marginalized during that time. Remember all these things. Because that's what they want you to forget. They want you to forget those things because a tragedy occurred in Queensland. A tragedy occurred there, so they want you to forget everything that happened during that time. The police have been asking for the public to trust them for quite some time. But if they didn't have an agenda in the media, why would they turn straight away to so-called 
conspiracy theorists and anti-COVID protesters. Why would they start demonizing these people if they didn't have an agenda going into this? Like, they just start to drip feed these facts that come out after the event. And why is it always someone who opposes their agenda? Why isn't it ever a person who is a rabid vaxxer or something like that, yeah? It's, it's never that when it is some kind of a setup, yeah? That's how you know it's a setup too. I'm not going to pretend to know what went on there. A, it's too early. And B, they're controlling the narrative at this point. But we do have questions for the media. We have questions for the mainstream media that control the agenda and socially engineer the Australian people. Here are our questions about the shooting in Queensland. The police and media had said since the beginning that there was no intelligence telling them that there was any increased danger in approaching the property. That this was a standard job, a routine missing persons call out. If that is the case, then why did they need to send four four armed police to the address searching for Nathaniel Train when they arrived? And when they arrived, why did they jump the fence to enter the property owned by his brother Gareth? who is the conspiracy theorist brother, they say, who radicalized him. The killings have been described as a calculated execution. If the police had been searching for Nathaniel Train since December 2021 and had decided to step up their investigation after he cut contact with other family members in October 2022, then how did the brothers know the police were going to arrive that day? It is widely reported that the men were heavily armed and camouflaged, wearing fatigues, and lay in wait to ambush the four young cops when they arrived. The police have said over and over again that the officers stood no chance. Why is this the case? Four trained shooters from Queensland Police against two untrained school teachers. Well, I think one is a is a youth counsellor or something. I doubt Gareth's wife, Stacey, did much of the damage that day. Also, the kill-to-injured ratio of 50% is rather high for unprofessional shooters. Wound Ballistics Review commented in regard to the Port Arthur Massacre that untrained marksmen generally, generally injure twice as many as they kill when they go on gun rampages. Therefore, their kill ratio is double that of a novice and in the realm of police or military. Much like the Port Arthur and Christchurch tragedies of 1996 and 2019, respectively. According to the two police, as soon as the officers jumped the fence, they were hit with a hail of bullets. Are they saying that Nathaniel had been waiting since October for them to finally catch up with him? at which point they were waiting and ready in camouflage and armed to the teeth, who tipped off the police to his whereabouts and who let them know they were on their way? Some of these things may come out soon, but we're just asking questions because the media doesn't really ask these questions. The media has reported that the trio Set a, gr- set a grassy area of the property on fire in an attempt to smoke out a young, injured female police officer or to burn her alive. This sounds rather professional for, sc- for a school teacher and a youth counsellor. It is also reminiscent of the end of the Port Arthur Massacre where Martin Bryant set ski- seascape cottages ablaze and came out on fire himself to be apprehended by police ending the siege. On that, on that occasion, it was more than likely lit by the police themselves to destroy evidence and bring forth the patsy. Back to the siege at Chinchilla, though, and the scene of the fire attracts an innocent bystander. Gareth's neighbour, Alan Dare, is shot in the back investigating the inferno. Who knows what happened there? 
but it definitely helps the narrative to have a member of the public killed in the carnage also. The murder of Alan Dare brings the kill to injured ratio up to 3 out of 5. That's 60%, which is above Brenton Tarrant at Christchurch, 56%, and just below Martin Bryant at 63%, which was described as satanic accuracy by Brigadier Ted Sarong, head of Australian forces in Vietnam. If all four officers were wearing body cameras at the scene of the crime, then when can we see the unedited footage of what happens so we can have a full picture of what, en- what, what went on that day? Or will the police and media seek to control the narrative as they paint a picture for the public that suits their agenda? Just as we saw in Port Arthur, where the video footage of the Broad Arrow Cafe shooting was never shown to the public and the mentally impaired Martin Bryant was coerced over a seven-month period in isolation to plead guilty to the murders of 35 people. Forgoing a trial and giving the media total authority as judge and jury in the biggest miscarriage of justice the nation has ever seen. Also, why were police happy to describe Nathaniel Train as of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander appearance in the missing persons report in the missing persons report as recently as the eighth of December, twenty twenty two? Not that his race matters, but it seems strange that the media has n- made no mention of this since he has been identified as the main person of interest. Is this an attempt to whitewash his identity and paint a picture of a mainstream white Australian anti-vaccine freedom protester hell-bent on revenge with authorities? Are they worried this will affect the upcoming referendum of the Aboriginal voice on Parliament? Why is the government and mainstream media so partisan on this subject also? If the men accused of this atrocity were rabid conspiracy theorists who were aware of the false flag event at Port Arthur 26 years ago, then why would they seek to become victims of the very same system and serve the very same agenda that Patsy Martin Bryant did so well that fateful day in Tasmania? If they were aware and believed that the government uses people to fulfill satanic agendas with the full complicity of the media, then why on earth would they organise so meticulously to sacrifice everything to be part of it? You have to ask that question, don't you? If these men really are what they say they are, how could they be so stupid to just become that? You'd think if they had been thinking about this subject, like I have, and like many Australians have, no matter how much they demonise us, that you wouldn't want to become part of that because you'd be aware of it. You'd be aware of that. Only people who aren't aware of it would ever become a, a patsy, and no one would ever become a willing patsy. You'd have to be set up in some way. And it's very easy to set things up when you have control of the media. You have a population that is largely asleep. You have the police. who still There's still trust there. People, it tugs at the heartstrings when, when cops get killed out there. And no one likes to see it. No matter how bad relations are with police and people, no one likes to see it. And they know that. And they need this sympathy and they're asking for the sympathy basically but the government is aware of the amount of people that woke up during 2021 they saw the protests they saw the people they read about the anger online or the disaffected masses the people that really really woke up me being one of them uh, that time woke you up. It was like being, it was like being disregarded by the nation in a way, pushed away, and many people were affected by that. But they're not bad people. They're the best people that this nation has. They're the ones who are telling their family members to open their eyes, to not believe everything the government says, because it's dangerous to do that. 
because it's killing people right now and they want to cover up what they've done to them. They want them to stay asleep, keep complying with things that are going to kill them. They want them to never find out about the awful things that they've done and so they can continue to manipulate them. If people don't see the patterns of what they've done before, they'll never see it coming the next time. And that's what they're dealing with with these people that are awake, people who can see the patterns. They can see what they, what they did last time. They can see it coming a mile away this time. They're not fooled by this either. And they won't be fooled by the next thing. And that scares them. But they should just embrace those people. If we were a real country, we would. If we had freedoms here, we would. But once you lose your freedoms to a tyrannical government like this, the only way to get them back is for the government to completely collapse. So, how would that happen? We could lose a war. No one wants that, do we? Um, There could be some kind of revolution, but I doubt it. The only way to have freedom in Australia in 2022 and beyond is to become free within yourself you can't be blaming what's outside of you for what's going on half the time like i can point this out to you and you can point this out to other people but the only way to freedom and really seeing the truth is to be free within that's the problem with many movements out there is they do point to someone else or something else then they end up looking angry and can be easily set up for future psyops and false flags using their movement as a straw man to point to. The only way is to become free within. You need inner peace. I found that personally through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ woke me up to the truth. Jesus Christ allows me to see the truth. Seek the truth and speak the truth and gives me the courage to do so. That even if I was in a jail cell or if I was going to have my head chopped off, that I wouldn't be afraid to do it because I've got Jesus. And that's what it's like being born again. And that's what happened to me when they locked us down. I was always a seek truther. I mean, a truth seeker. <laughs> Uh, but I didn't really know the meaning of it until I saw the truth of Jesus and he saved me. So being free from sin is something that we can all attain. But we have this government, media and the authorities trying to frame up innocent Australians and blame them, straw man them, demonize them, And blame them for atrocities like this, when it's got nothing to do with any of us. Most of us don't live in Queensland, rural Queensland, do we? Most people that believe in conspiracy theories, so-called conspiracies, these are people who are truth seekers, yes? Just because they don't believe in the government lies of a mainstream media that has agendas and is socially engineering the planet, the entire nation, is, is run by a satanic agenda, just because they don't believe that and can see it for what it is, doesn't mean that they're bad people or they're wrong. Most of the time they're right, and they've been proven to be right, and the government can't stand this because the truth is coming out. You can't stop the truth. The truth always overcomes lies. The only way they can do it is to suppress it. They have to put a spirit of fear in you so you are too, as- you are too scared and asleep. And you just comply with the, with the ones you are fearful of. That Stockholm Syndrome. It's a demonic satanic attack on the mind of the people. It's demonic mind control by the mass mainstream mass media. And we have... There are entities behind the government. That it is a satanic new world order. Everything in life is spiritual. And behind every person is a spirit, whether it be good or evil. The government is run by evil. 
The New World Order is run by evil. They have implemented a globalist agenda of control. They want to in- implement full control over you through a social credit system. They do practice mind control on the public and socially engineer them. It is a spiritual battle between good and evil. And if you're listening to this broadcast, you're on the side of good. The truth. The only hateful, the most hateful thing you can do to somebody is lie to them. To keep them in the dark about something. To manipulate somebody is a hate crime. And they're doing it on a mass level. So to call people who seek the truth haters is a massive lie in itself. And is a hate crime. And they're committing a hate crime on you when they blame us as a collective group of truth seekers in this country for atrocities like this when it wasn't a truth seeker who did the Christchurch massacre, was it? That was somebody bound by the lies of the devil. Who is the father of lies? That's what Jesus says. Uh, Martin Bryant was somebody who was a patsy. He sits in a cell for the last 26 years. He, yes, has a 66 IQ and never received a trial. He, he didn't, he couldn't have pulled off the massacre in the Broad Arrow Cafe. The statistics on his kill to injured ratio are through the roof. If Wound Ballistics Review says that it's that uh, people who aren't trained generally have a double uh, injured to killed ratio, well, he killed 35 people and injured like 20. He had a 23, sorry, he had a 63% kill ratio. And he he shot 20 of those people through the head from the right hip one-handed in the Broad Arrow Cafe. That was 20, all through the head. They say it was a, it had to be one of the top shooters in the world that pulled that off. And that is Brigadier Ted Sarong, head of Australian forces in Vietnam. Satanic accuracy, he called it. He couldn't have done it, possibly. There's a million reasons. Why he couldn't have done it. I urge you to watch my video on this. It is called The Setup of Martin Bryant. Strange Happenings at Port Arthur. You can find it on my YouTube channel. But. These weren't people. For example. These weren't people who were believing. The truth. Martin Bryant. Probably didn't have the IQ. To really really seek the truth. Uh, Brenton Tarrant was bound by the lies of the devil. He was blinded by hate. And the government, though, are big-time haters. But what did Tarrant do? He accomplished something for the government. What did Port Arthur do? It accomplished something for the, for the government. They're trying to link this to Port Arthur conspiracies here, what happened in Queensland, to accomplish something for the government. So they can demonize truth-seekers, Suppress the truth about what really happened at Port Arthur because they know that there's a whole new generation of people out there seeking the truth about this as time has gone on because the media, because the internet is like infinite and people can search stuff. It's not like it was in 1996. So they're scared of these truth seeking people and they're looking to demonize them. It says here. In the Brisbane Times, I noticed that over the past year, they've had several articles prepping for this because there is articles like going back over a year to when the protest movement was on, ex- extreme extremism experts warn of lone actor attacks, attack risk among freedom protesters, setting the pavement for this. Melbourne's conspiracy movement is traumatized, incoherent, and potentially dangerous. And then the other day, we have accounts linked to Queensland police shooter active on conspiracy sites. I'll read a little bit from the article 
Melbourne's conspiracy movement is traumatised, incoherent and potentially dangerous by Elise Thomas on the 18th of November 2021, right at the height of the conspiracy. She's a disinformation and conspiracy analyst. Analysts of the growing anti-lockdown movements and the COVID sceptic movement in Australia, particularly in Melbourne, are increasingly missing the wood f- for the trees. That's a weird one. I thought it was the forest for the trees. As media and commentators doggedly search for far-right influence, there is a preoccupation with the notion that COVID skepticism is a gateway to far-right extremism that misses the crucial point. These movements are already extreme. So here we go. They're trying to... A a year ago, they were setting the... In the Brisbane Times, commenting on what was going on in Melbourne which was a legitimate freedom protest movement against tyranny, they were calling these people extremists. These Most of these people were people's grandmothers and stuff. Yeah? There were people who were sick of the lockdowns that did fight with the police, but the police were heavy-handed with them in every way, shape, and form. She goes on to say, they're not just predominantly far right. In fact, the movements as a whole don't have any coherent ideology at all. Well, that's good, isn't it? Because those ideo- ideologies are all mind control. If you're um, if you're beholden to communism or national socialism, you're under mind control, and it's demonic. Every time it's antichrist, it is always atheist. That doesn't make them less radical or less concerning. Well, it's more concerning for them because they can pigeonhole right wingers and left wingers. Over the past several months, I've watched the rapid escalation and radicalization of the anti-lockdown, anti-vaccine and COVID skeptic movements in Australia. During the long, painful lockdowns in New South Wales and Victoria, anti-lockdown and conspiracy communities on the social media have experienced enormous growth. Yes, people woke up during that time and it scares them. Existing anti-lockdown Facebook groups and Telegram channels have doubled or even tripled in size and a multitude of new groups and channels have sprung up. Tens of thousands of social media users have been sucked into conspiracy theories and in some cases for the first time. As we've seen in many countries around the world, the stresses and and traumas of lockdown are often accompanied by booming conspiracy theories. Yeah, because the government was repressing information, lying to the people constantly, and uh, instigating communism. And since then, they have instigated wealth transfer that you see overseas. They're taking farms. We're going. We're, we're destroying our industries. They're pushing this climate change insanity, which is a fable. Uh, the, there is a war on the truth. And a war, as Alex Jones would say on his website, a war for your mind. But it is a war for your soul. And it is a war between Christ and the devil, between truth and lies, good and evil, light and darkness. As we've seen in many countries around the world, okay, where are we now? Implicit and explicit calls for violence, particularly against politicians, are becoming increasingly common. This rhetoric is bleeding off the screen and into the real world as the streets of Melbourne and Sydney have become the scenes of intense and in some cases violent protests. Yeah, because the police were violent with them. Many in the media have begun hunting for links between these protesters and the far right. They speculate, often without presenting any hard evidence, that a shadowy far right influence was responsible for causing the protests or alternatively is using the protests as a recruiting ground. Well, yeah, that didn't work because it wasn't that. This was a movement of the people at the time. People were rightfully protesting and they were trying to suppress those protests, drive them inside so they could be forcibly, basically, mandated into taking things into their body, giving up their freedoms, giving their children up to this satanic system. The presence of known individuals with links to the far right at protests has been highlighted as proof of their influence over the movement, despite these being just a handful of attendees among protests of thousands. To be clear, there is a far right element involved in the anti-lockdown movement. 
While this element is very much a mon- minority, its role is nonetheless concerning and we should be w- and should be watched carefully. However, the disproportionate focus on the potential threats of far-right extremism often seems to overlook the elephant which is already in the room, stomping around and trumpeting loudly and knocking things over. Conspiracy extremism. So here we go. Over a year ago, they were making it about people seeking the truth and making them the extremists now. And as it says here in another article from the Brisbane Times, words matter. ASIO to stop referring to right-wing and Islamic extremism. So they've moved on now from that. So the age of the right-wing extremist as the bad guy has ended. The age of the Islamic bad guy has ended too. That those ended with the COVID thing. Now, it is about normal people who seek the truth and go to protests and like to share the truth online and don't believe what the government's telling them. People who aren't under mind control because they're not under the mind control of any radical groups either. These are the ones they're really scared of and they're going to demonize them. Get ready for more chaos. Get ready for more demonization from these people, from the media who are attacking Christians now as well because they know that they are at the heart of the truth. So you got ASIO looking into these people, just normal people now. They're not part of any groups. They're just people who don't buy the government line, don't comply with insane mandates, don't go along with it. And now they are the extremists. It's come a long way from 9-11 where they were going after people that blew up towers, yeah? Now they're going after you. They're going after you. And first it was the so-called Nazis. First it was the so-called Islamists, the terrorists. And now they're coming after you and everybody. And this is going to be what they're like under the social credit system. They're going to come for your thoughts. You're a thought criminal. Now I'm going to show you something that was on the ABC. So I'll cut to that video right now. Uh, Australians, what they thought about a wide variety of conspiracy theory beliefs. And in one of them, we asked about this specific Port Arthur shooting, whether or not it was uh, a deliberate false flag type event in order to restrict gun ownership for Australians. And we surprisingly and, and perhaps slightly worryingly found that in that case, around about 12% agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. And what comes first? Do conspiracy theories lead to antisocial behaviour or does antisocial behaviour then fuel belief in conspiracy theories? That's a really good question and I'm not sure we know enough yet. Um, It could quite possibly be the case that uh, people are drawn to conspiracy theories uh, because they themselves uh, engage in antisocial behaviour or, or certainly there are experiments that do indicate that exposing people to conspiracy theories do lead them to uh, report wanting to engage in more antisocial behaviour. So, for example, a, a particular study that exposed people to conspiracy theories found that they were more likely to report wanting to engage in sort of everyday uh, crime and theft, and this was really explained by... Uh, them reporting a, a sort of a decreased trust in others and idea that society's fabric was breaking down. Now, some people can hold these beliefs, but when does it lead to violence or crime? Yeah, so again, a, a really good question. So again, these are beliefs, and, and to some extent, believing in a conspiracy theory is uh, fairly common. Our research has found that, that you know, provide people a list and, and maybe over 50% of the sample will endorse one statement. But in this case, we can be looking at things like these sort of extremist beliefs or conspiracy theories which are quite pernicious, like the ones around the Port Arthur massacre, and we know that Uh, in these cases that conspiracy theories often serve as what's called a radicalising multiplier for people in extremist groups. Um, And studies suggest that, you know, people who do endorse these sorts of conspiracy theories are more supportive of violence, violent extremism, uh, violent attacks on people in power and those sorts of um, aspects as well. 
and social media and even traditional media, but in, a, in an echo chamber like way, that can really fuel this. Yeah, it's quite possible that's uh, another sort of amplifier in the sense that it's much easier to find other like-minded people or people who believe in the same sorts of things that you might do so and so in that way kind of creates this false consensus or this kind of distorted shared normative belief that your beliefs that you hold in, in this case if they are quite extreme are shared by lots of other people and that would itself create a problem in kind of tearing you further away from, I guess, a shared reality that most of us have. Conspiracy theories thrive in periods of unrest, and we've actually seen that globally throughout the pandemic. So what have we seen in terms of online activity and these beliefs? I mean, I know it's very recent. Have you been able to study it? Well, certainly we know that um, conspiracy theories aren't new, and uh, so far as back as Roman times, um, you know, people were espousing conspiracy theories about sort of Emperor Nero and the burning of Rome in sort of AD 64. Yeah, the recent pandemic really provided a fertile ground for believing in conspiracy theories. And a lot of that has to do really with the conditions, the social conditions. People were isolated. People were feeling quite uncertain. People were feeling uh, quite separated or, or socially isolated from others uh, and looking for answers. People really want to resolve this uncertainty and, and make sense of the world around us. And so for some people, conspiracy theories offer that kind of narrative that helps people make sense of what's going around them, help them reduce their anxiety in some way um, and, and those sorts of things. So we did at least see a reported rise in conspiracy theory belief. Um, interestingly, some other research that's tried to sort of answer, you know, are conspiracy theories on the rise really leaves it as a, a slightly kind of unanswered question or maybe one that suggests maybe they're not necessarily on the rise, but maybe we're just paying more attention to them. And it is a spectrum, as I know you pointed out, you know, at, at one end it can be someone who's, you know, a little quirky, has their beliefs, it's kind of funny, and at the other end it can be violent. Um, what do you do if you know someone that's exhibiting that sort of behaviour at that end of the spectrum that you really wouldn't want to see? Well, I think it's important to understand that, as you pointed out, that, you know, it can be across the spectrum. I guess if the person is important to you or it's a family member or someone you really care about them, then it would be important to try to get that person some help, uh, perhaps by speaking to your GP or another qualified professional um, to, to engage with them. Um, these are beliefs that people hold dear to themselves. So, uh, you know, approaches that won't work would be arguing with the person or trying to convince them necessarily that they're wrong. I mean, most of us usually don't change our minds when we're wrong and especially would be less likely to do so if it was such a, a deeply held conviction. We know from other sort of research about people who are in extreme groups or extremist ideologies that really it takes a lot to do that. It's doing things like accessing services to uh, promote rehabilitation for those uh, people and reintegration into society or, or disengagement from violence in some cases. Dr Matthew Marks from La Trobe University, thank you for your insights on this. So there you have it, truth seekers. You're wrong. You're mentally ill. You're antisocial, criminals, thought criminals, and you need to get help according to the ABC, if you don't believe what the government says. So how long until they're locking us up into mental health facilities because we don't agree with the official line? How long are they going to, until they do that? If, if something doesn't happen in this country and people don't wake up and stop going along with lies, yeah, they're blinded by the lies, clearly. When you go along with a lie... You're practically under mind control. You, that the person that's told you the lie or the authority that has told you the lie has got you going along with something that isn't true. You have it happening on a mass scale and that is the problem at hand here. And now they're at war with the truth. They want to say what is true and what isn't. They want to control your thoughts and they want to make sure that you don't step out of line in the future. Because according to them, the 3% of the population that didn't go along with things, well, those people are criminals. They're criminals for thinking for themselves.
they think that we have to be all in agreement on everything. That we have to be all living in this shared reality, as they put it. Well, it's called clown world. It's not reality. They have had a reality constructed by them by the social engineers in the mainstream media coming down from the authorities who are running a satanic agenda. They're not living in the real world themselves. They don't want to look at the truth of what they put into themselves during that period of time. The authorities are trying to cover up anything getting out about that. But they have a hard time doing that with the internet. So they need to create events like this to demonize you. I mean, how quick have they gone into demonizing sections of the public because of this? Nobody was in touch with Nathaniel Train. Nobody had anything to do with it. The only thing that have to do with this narrative, the only people that have anything to do with it, is the government themselves and the police. Now, you can look at the police here and say, what's going on? Why did they send these young kids out there? I mean, there's clearly they're clearly not telling us the full picture. They sent four of them, and they said there was no intelligence saying that there was anything wrong. But generally, you don't send four people on a missing persons thing. Generally, they don't have to jump the fence on a missing persons thing. That means that there was intelligence that someone was there that they had to apprehend like a criminal. They had to jump the fence at the property. And uh, something's not adding up there. So why did they send these young, inexperienced people down there like lambs to the slaughter? Well, they keep saying the word sacrifice, that these people, their sacrifice, and all that, all that kind of language. The police are uh, a uh, fraternal order. You have a look, there's, there's fraternities. There's, there is Masonic influence over the police force worldwide. Everybody knows that. That if you even look at the police logo in Australia, it is a chessboard. A chessboard of division. A chessboard. It is the blue and the white. But when you go to any Masonic lodge, they have a black and white chessboard on the floor of their of their lodge that is the duality the good and the evil doing good in the light that people can see doing evil in the dark that is that is their spirituality at, down at the masons so they've got that connection there we know about masons in the higher levels worshiping other entities, things like Lucifer. It's just a fact. It's just a fact if you look into it. So, but just look at that. Look at the police logo, the chessboard checkers. Know that that's a Masonic symbol. Know that that's some Masonic symbology right in your face. Know that they're part of the power structure. Remember what happened in 2021 and how they turned on the people. Don't forget these things and understand them. So you know that you're being, who's manipulating you? Know that when you look at Parliament House, you see that large pyramid there. So you have that. You have that there's a chance that these poor young people were sent there to be cannon fodder for this agenda. They didn't send anybody senior down there to get shot at, did they? They sent women too. That's probably going to garner maximum sympathy and maximum hatred for those that they demonize through this. I'm not pretending to know what happened here. I'm just telling you what I see. Now, there's also the fact that they sent out this older lady from the police station down there to talk to everybody and I'll show you a clip of her in a second I just want you to note that she's acting it seems as though she's acting doesn't it I mean she's got the croaky sort of voice like she's putting on a real performance there 
yet her eyes are not red. It doesn't look like she's really been crying. And she managed to go on multiple media outlets and play this up. Her, her eyes are not red. They're not puffed up. She pretended to wipe away a tear at one point. It was totally not believable. Anybody watching with a skeptical eye could see that. Why is she going up there with this croaky voice, putting on a performance, trying to garner sympathy, when the, then when the act of what happened should be sympathy enough? What's the agenda here? So let's have a look at the lady they had to front the media yesterday. Two years. Losing one of our own has a profound impact on every single officer in their families. To lose two officers in one incident is absolutely devastating. Extremely emotional and challenging time for the Queensland Police Service. In one incident is absolutely devastating. This event is the largest loss of life, police life, we have suffered in a single incident in many years. My heartfelt sympathies and condolences go out to their loved ones, friends and colleagues. The thoughts of the entire police family are with them at this extremely difficult time. Police Commissioner Katarina Carroll joins us now. Commissioner, it's so hard to know what to say. What a confronting day for you. How are you and how's the rest of the police force holding up? I think um, we're all travelling not too well at all. Um, it's been a tragic day, a day of mourning across the QPS, um, the state and the country. I went in and saw my staff at Dole Beach in Chilla, met with the Tara officers, phoned the parents of our fallen officers and met with and spoke to the two that survived. They have been incredibly difficult conversations and an incredibly difficult day for everyone concerned. I'm, what you're asked to do at the best of times, let alone on a day like this, is just seems so unfathomable to all of us. Those phone calls with the families of the fallen officers, how are they doing? Uh, they're not doing well. Um, they're not doing well. Their um, colleagues aren't doing well. We're all in tears. Uh, we're all upset. In many ways, I think even angry because it's hard to understand, you know, a call where you're protecting the community. Uh, it's very hard to fathom, to make sense of what's occurred. And that's, you know, we have the investigation now that started. We will get to the bottom of this. It seems callous, it seems senseless. Uh, it is a, one of the most tragic days in policing history. Commissioner, you walked through the crime scene today. That must have been terribly confronting. Yeah, I had to do that. I had to see what happened, where it happened, and try to get a sense of why it happened. What was very clear, very clear, is they didn't stand a chance. I cannot believe that two officers made it out of there and bravely did what they had to do to survive and to call for help. Sadly, we did lose two officers, though. And as I said, going to the crime scene and seeing what they were confronted with, in my opinion, it was not survivable. I imagine there's something terrifying as well about the fact that this was such routine police business, that this is not meant to end up in anything remarkable at, at all. Do you f get this sense across the force that police are terrified or, or at the very least just shaken to do the very basics of their jobs? I think definitely shaken. You know, we've heard from many officers, received many emails, many texts. These are routine calls. Police do thousands and thousands across the state every day. This was a routine call. Four officers who I know were happy to be there, joking, you know, enjoying the day. And what they encountered was just incredibly, incredibly difficult to understand. Are you any closer to finding out what the motive behind this attack was? This will be a thorough investigation. We have a lot of work to do. I anticipate this won't be over the next day or so. 
uh, there is relatives to interview, friends to interview. At the end of the day, I and the community and the Queensland Police Service of officers want to understand why this happened. One of the strangest aspects of this is Nathaniel Train, who was missing uh, for a year, and then he turns up, and he turns up in this context, which is I mean, incredible. Was he actually missing, or does it turn out he was on the run? No, we believe that he was genuinely missing uh, for a year. And although there was phone contact, from what I understand, uh, that stopped some days ago. So a person was concerned, and police went there for a routine missing persons check. And sadly and devastatingly, uh, this is how it's ended up. One of the offenders, Gareth Train, was heavily involved in the online conspiracy community. Is that an avenue that you'll be investigating? Yes, definitely, definitely. As I said, uh, we will not leave a stone unturned. Um, every aspect of their lives will be investigated, interrogated, interrogated. Everyone who had contact with them over a period of time uh, it will be a very thorough and it is going to be a very complex investigation. But for myself as the Commissioner, I need to explain to the community and to the Queensland Police and particularly to the parents of those officers and those that survive uh, what happened here so that we can understand better for the future, but we do need to know. Police Commissioner, we thank you very much for your time and our condolences once again. So there you go, she lays it on pretty thick there. And so did other members of the police that fronted the media and the media in unison with them, lockstep, as always, with the authorities and the government. Now, just to, in closing here, just some other things that I found a little strange about this event. I don't, we don't know what has gone on here. We do know that there is an agenda at play. But there's also strange things, strange anomalies that point to some dark spirituality involved with this event, just like we see with all of these events. We see the number 66 involved with the Queensland police shooting, just as we did with Port Arthur, Christchurch and other events. So the event occurred on the 12th of the 12th. 2022 if you add 12 plus 12 you get 24 plus 20 you get 44 add 22 and you get 66 that is the devil's favorite number 66 if you add 1 plus 2 for the first 12 you get 3 then you add 1 plus 2 again for the second 12, you get 3 again. Add 3 and 3 and you get 6. Then you add up 20 for 2022. 2 plus 0 plus 2 plus 2 equals 6. So it occurred on 6-6. Six, six, or the entire date adds up to 6-6. Six, six. 6 people were killed on the day. 2 of them were police officers. 1 was 26. Or 2-6. Six, six. The other was 29, both very young. Two, nine. You flip a nine, you get a six. This is how the spiritual numbers work out. This is how you work these things out with the, the uh, demonic involvement in these false flags. They always come up six, six every single time. So you got six, 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 six for the two slain police officers. That's how you know this is a satanic attack. The dates, the ages of the people that died. The, this, and there's also the links that they made to the Port Arthur Massacre through the media by linking that to Gareth Train and his brother and his father who's a Christian pastor, I believe. Um, anyway, so they said they're, con they're Port Arthur conspiracy theorists. Well, it's been 26 years since the massacre at Port Arthur carried out by uh, the Australian government and authorities. 2-6 for 26 years, 6-6. Six, six. 16 officers came to the property to rescue the two injured police. That is 1-6, so 6. And 6 hours later, 
the siege was resolved in a gunfight. 6-6. Six, six. And there should be many more things like this as it comes out. Also, whenever I look at the picture of the actual property that they keep showing on the news, you can see the road and it makes a 6. An upside down 6 and a and a upside down 9 in the circle there which I'll put up on the screen now so you can see what I'm talking about. That might just be me who sees that. But I see 6-6 six, six there as well. So Satan's fingerprints are all over this attack. It is a demonic satanic attack that occurred. There is some kind of agenda going on here from our demonic government. And they are looking to demonize everyday Australians that don't go along with the lies of the mainstream media and our globalist government here in Australia. So there you have it, Truth Seekers. That is it for today's episode of Truth Core. If you enjoyed this and you'd like to get in contact with us about anything, if you have articles you'd like to share, um, yeah, obviously don't flood our inbox. Just like... Leave it in the comments section or something. But if, you, if you've if you got something important you'd like to talk to us about, by all means, email us at admin at truthcore.au. And don't forget that you need to be strong in this fight because they are coming for us all. They are coming for us. They want to control our thoughts. They are making thought criminals out of everyday people now. Remember they said it's no longer about the right-wing extremists or the Islamists. It's about everyday people who they believe believe conspiracy theories. Those are things that are not sanctioned as truth by the government. Their truth, not the truth. But as Jesus Christ says, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's a spiritual battle between good and evil within. You can be free. It doesn't matter how many freedoms they take away from you. You can be free in the truth. They can never take the truth away because the truth comes from the Lord. Glory, glory, hallelujah. So yeah, that's it for this episode. Uh, this is an ongoing thing. I guess we'll be talking about this down the track. Rest in peace to all those that, that died, including the police officers, the uh, the innocent bystander, and even those who, who got shot. Even those who are accused. Rest in peace to all involved with that tragic event in Queensland. So just remember, people, seek the truth, speak the truth. This was Truth Core. And as always, peace out and praise God. <laughs>